And it turned out that at least five minutes a day of some sort of slow breathing technique can significantly reduce our stress levels. Just the less breathing itself uh, can help with energy, endurance, blood flow. I was like, I gotta try this and see. And it changed my life. It's like, this is crazy. I have so much energy. Let's just jump right into it off the bat. How did you get into breath work and why is breath so fascinating to you? Yeah, so I got into it through a personal you know, journey of, of, of trying to be better and improve my diabetes. So I'm a type one diabetic. And I actually first discovered the Wim Hof method, which a lot of people probably can resonate with, right? You hear Wim Hof on a podcast. This was in 2015, I think, 2015 or 2016. I heard him. Uh, maybe he was on Tim Ferriss or something and he, you know, he was full of charisma and it got me really interested in breathing. So I started doing his protocol and and became really fascinated with it, but it actually wasn't until I discovered oxygen advantage and Patrick McEwen's work on nasal breathing, breathing less, slow breathing, even some breath hold practices that I became obsessed like I am today, just trying to understand it. So when I switched to the oxygen advantage and really implemented some of the principles of nasal breathing, especially at night um, and slower breathing, my blood sugars got better. And I thought, this is interesting. Like, how could something as simple as breathing impact my blood sugars? And I'm a type one, so my blood sugars fluctuate a lot more. You know, it's it's pretty regular for your blood sugars to fluctuate as a type one. And you're I've had it since I was 11. So I'm pretty tuned in to when a change makes a difference. And so I knew this is the only real major thing I've changed in my life. So there has to be something going on with this breathing stuff. And so I started researching about it and just trying to figure out what is happening inside of my body. And it led me down a rabbit hole that I'm seven years into now and and probably will never stop. So, uh, so that's how I got into is really just like, out of, I guess, sort of a, when it started with Wim Hof, it was kind of like more, you know, I was looking for something more in life. Um, my sister had passed away and I was kind of just like interested in like, what is, what are we here for? And things like that. And Wim came along, but then it was the health stuff with slower breathing, nasal breathing with my diabetes that really got me obsessed with it. And I said, I got to figure out what's going on. Um, and, and now, yeah, now I'm, I'm fascinated with it. And, uh, it basically impacts every aspect of our life. And so I've, I've found that it's like one of this, re- like just a really cool tool for anything you're into. So like it can be adapted to basically if you're into sports, well, yeah, you're, the way you breathe will affect. If you're into spirituality, breathing can be a portal into that. So it's just, it kind of has this universal uh, flavor to it that makes it really fun to study. And as I've grown, um, the things I used to be into I'm not anymore, but I still find a way to bring the breath in and things like that. So I'm, I'm kind of going on a ramble here. Sorry, but that that's that's how I got into it and part of why, why I'm so obsessed with it. Yeah. Well, it makes a lot of sense. Like it is true. Breath permeates no matter what you're doing, you're breathing. And so it will impact and, and be there with you no matter what you're you're doing. So to start, you, you, you weren't looking for health benefits. It was more of looking for something something bigger, exploring more of meaning of life, something deeper. And then, and then you just experience the health benefits as a, an aside. Sort of. Yeah. I mean, I guess when you hear Wim Hof, he did talk a lot about inflammation and autoimmune disease, which is what a type one diabetes is and autoimmune disease. So that was in there like, oh, it's going to help with my health and things. But I mean, I was really into like, the seeing the lights and all the little funny things that come along with it. And I was a postdoc at the time. So it was like, I had my super sciencey life I was living. And then it was like when I would go home or in the morning, usually it was like, this was kind of like my balancing act to keep, keep that side of me uh, up to level too. So I would do the breathing stuff sort of as like a, yeah, health, but a lot of more of just like what, what's out there? What am I capable of? What's, is there more to this world? And then um, it, yeah, it wasn't till I stumbled into the oxygen advantage and Patrick McEwen that I really w- discovered, like experienced the health benefits. And then, yeah, that's, that's where, so it was, yeah, it was almost, uh, basically luck that with Patrick McEwen, you know, I taped my mouth at night, which I don't, you know, I'm not a doctor. I don't advise people, God, just tape your mouth unless you, you're safe with it. But, um, 
but that was a really uh, profound change for me. And then that led into just learning about all the different aspects of how the breath can be used for health and then for just living a better life, being wiser, like as your, as your podcast title uh, implies. Yeah. We can all use a little more, more <laughs> wisdom right. in our that's lives right. for sure. Okay. So the, so the mouth tape, that's interesting. So what, um, if anyone's not familiar with Patrick McEwen's work is, can you give an overview is, is it sounds like mouth taping is what he introduced that idea to you and, and where else did you take it from there? Sure. Yeah. So, so Patrick McEwen uh, is the author of the oxygen advantage. That's a, a breathing technique that he kind of developed off of a prior breathing technique called Buteco breathing. And Patrick's just an amazing human. I love Patrick. I trained under him and I'm a huge fan of what he does, but his, he has kind of a lot of angles. He's, he's approaching breathing um, very holistically, but the biggest one probably is like nasal breathing and breathing less, like teaching your body to not over breathe. And the logic is that a lot of us are mouth breathers um, through habitual patterns, chronic stress, sitting at a desk, all these different things leads to us using our mouth more and breathing more air than our bodies actually need. Um, and so his theory kind of is like to reduce our breathing volume and and breathe through our nose primarily. And he has a lot of methods for doing that. And then on top of that, he brings in breath hold training to simulate high altitude and that can help with performance. And so a lot of people who get in the oxygen oxygen advantage are actually sports. They're really into performance. They're hold, they're doing these breath holds to um, to basically improve their CO2 tolerance and drop their blood oxygen saturation to get some of those benefits of uh, more red blood cells and all that. But yes, one of the things he talks about is mouth tape. Breathing through our nose is so important. There's, you know, seven to nine hours every day if you if you can tolerate mouth tape to breathe through your nose while you sleep. And there's a lot of benefits. Like there's tons of, of research now showing it helps, or at least breathing through your nose at night helps. Um, but there's mixed stuff on mouth tape because if you fully cover your mouth, it can be dangerous because you need kind of that safety route and, um, and, and you can get this mouth puffing phenomenon where if you can't exhale through your mouth, it can cause problems. So uh, there's, there's intricacies with everything, right? There's always uh, a give and take, but that is one of the things he suggested was mouth tape. And I was listening to him as I was driving uh, down A1A here in, in near Cocoa Beach where you know we were t- discussing earlier. And I stopped at uh, the local pharmacy, bought some tape, and tried it. I was like, I got to try this and see. And it changed my life. It's like the next few days, I was like, this is crazy. I have so much energy. I didn't realize how poorly I was sleeping. Um, so, so that's, yeah, that's definitely one of his uh, major, I get, yeah, it's one of the, the major components of his program, but there's a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm sure it's deep work. Okay, so just from mouth taping, you noticed a, a spike in energy. Oh yeah. It was huge. Like, and, and again, like there, like my wife, she can tape her mouth and not feel anything. Like everyone's a little different. So I try not to sound like it's a, a, a you know, a cure all. But when, when I taped my mouth, it was like, I woke up like, who is this human? Like I had so much energy. I was like at work, like reading papers left and right, just so excited to connect ideas. And I just felt this surge. So I must have been like a terrible mouth breather, like all night with my mouth wide open. Um, and so, and to this day, like if I don't tape and my mouth falls open a little bit and, and, you know, you would think I would be 100% trained by now, but even if I don't, it still pops open sometimes and I'll feel like a difference in my energy. And so for me, it, it seems to be like, a yeah, very critical to, to my sleep, uh, depth, but that was the real, like, I guess pun intended night and day for me, like the mouth tape, um, to feel, that much energy from something so silly. I was just like, this is crazy. I was messaging my wife, I was at work and I emailed my wife like, this is like, I'm, this can't be real. Like, I, I cannot believe this, how good I feel and stuff. And so, but what's interesting is like, yeah, that, that helped, but like, it was really, that didn't help with the emotional regulation, all the other things that like learning deliberate breathing techniques Um, But that was the gateway drug, so to speak. It kind of made me believe in this stuff like, oh, this can have a physiological effect toward better health, not just the spiritual stuff and all that. Yeah, well, that's why it's fun to talk to people. And I love doing that on this podcast who 
do come across something that makes a big difference for them because you you just get the excitement, the enthusiasm, and when we talk about it, you know, people who hear it, it gives it gives them exposure to different ideas, and they can try them out, find out what what will be helpful for them. I started trying mouth taping because I had like insomnia, just felt terrible, and I was researching night and day, and I, I tried. I was like, I'll try anything, so I tried it. And I, I would say I fell somewhere in between you and, and your wife. Like I didn't have a huge benefit, but I did notice a benefit, especially over time. And, and now I'm the same way. It, it, it's uncomfortable to go to bed. Like if I run out of tape or I'm traveling and forgot it, like I don't sleep as well. Right. Yeah. And there is like, you know, there's some research showing that like there's tons of tons of different ways to look at it, but like nasal breathing at night can maintain a, a a steadier rhythm of breathing. Uh, it reduces incidence of like snoring and sleep apnea and, and all sorts of like really fascinating things that, you know, s- some research backs up these kind of crazy things, you know, we're talking about. So there's definitely a lot of evidence that mouth breathing at night is really detrimental. So it all makes like a, a lot of sense. And there's different ways of getting about this nasal breathing. Like there's different devices. It's kind of like if, if someone doesn't feel comfortable with mouth tape in any way, they feel like it's going to suffocate them or anything, look for other options because it is really, it can be really life-changing. So it's, yeah, it's definitely worth giving a shot as long as you do it safely. And I'll mention no association at all, but there's this tape um, I just recently found called v- VIO, Vital Oxygen, VIO2, that does what you're talking about. It kind of like just does the middle and it has kind of longer pieces on the bottom to keep it pushed together. Uh, so it gives you that safety release valve, um, and I love it. So that's that's what I've mainly switched to. Let's go to this principle. You, you mentioned Patrick McCown, and you did your training with him, and one of the tenets is nasal breathing because we breathe too much. And I think like people might hear that and be like, what, what do you mean? I thought we're supposed to breathe. I thought we're supposed to oxygenate. So what's the principle behind that? Sure, there's there's a concept called the Bohr effect. And that's really what the the whole premise of of Buteco and Patrick's work is, is that when we breathe in and out, you know, we're bringing in oxygen and then we're exhaling carbon dioxide. And so a lot of people think that carbon dioxide is a waste gas. We just need to get rid of all of it. And uh, so so as long as we're, we're, we're exhaling out carbon dioxide, that's a good thing. But it turns out, of course, you know, our bodies are magnificent. They, it, everything does something. And so carbon dioxide acts as kind of like a, I guess you could call it like a messenger, but it loosens the bond between oxygen and hemoglobin. So when you have more carbon dioxide in your bloodstream, it can, the oxygen can actually release easier into the tissues and cells. And so by over breathing, by chronically breathing more air than we need, our, our body, basically our red blood cells learn to, or the hemoglobin learn to basically hold on to that oxygen. They stick to, you know, it's more sticky, let's say. Um, and so you're not getting as much oxygen delivery to the tissues and the cells that need it. So by learning to, and it's not so much like just under breathing all the time. There's like, you know, certain ranges and and I wouldn't even know it off the top of my head anymore because I, <laughs> I gave up memorizing all these facts, but there's like, uh, you know, certain ranges of carbon dioxide levels that you can measure through exhaled CO2 tests and see if you're in the right range. Um, and, and, and that would kind of guide if you're over breathing or not for someone who's, who's super practical, uh, you could get a device, breathe in and out of it at your normal rate. And it'll kind of show you if you're over breathing or not. But yeah, the, the concept is reduce our breath volume so that we hold on to more carbon dioxide so that the oxygen we breathe in gets released, uh, into the tissues and cells. And if you're, you almost never have to worry about having not enough oxygen if you're at sea level. Like if, if you're just kind of a, a, an average person at sea level, when you breathe in and out, you're always going to be saturated between like 96 and 99% uh, with oxygen. Uh, basically all, all the places oxygen can be carried, you'll have about 96 to 99% of those uh, occupied. So you'll have plenty of oxygen. Uh, it's really hard to drop that if you're at sea level unless you hold your breath deliberately or you have a lung condition. So you don't have, like by breathing more, you don't actually get much more oxygen because you're basically saturated as it is. Uh, what you do is you get rid of more carbon dioxide. And so uh, that's where the problem comes in that if you're chronically over breathing, 
you're getting rid of more carbon dioxide, you're not really getting that much more oxygen, and you're actually not able to use the oxygen that you get. Um, so it's a kind of a funny balance our bodies have, have put in place. Because oxygen, you know, you hear of oxidative stress, like it actually causes, it can cause damage, right? And so our bodies kind of protect ourselves from it. We have this beautiful mechanism. I mean, it's like unbelievable to think that the pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere, by the time it gets to your cells, it's like, I think half a percent of that, like it's, it reduces it by like 99%. It's like our bodies are, I've heard there's this uh, book called Oxygen by Nick Lane, and he has this, uh, I'll, I won't try to quote him because I'll mess it up. But basically, he's like, our bodies are the biggest antioxidant on the planet. Like, our bodies are there to protect us from oxygen. It has this delicate circulation system to make sure we get just the right amount. And when we mess that up by over-breathing or even under-breathing, right, we have this delicate balance we're trying to achieve. And so the, the core behind Patrick's work is bringing it back into that balance to make sure we're getting... We, we have plenty of sufficient oxygen, but that we can release it where it's needed. Yeah, I like that word balance. I mean, as you're talking, I'm like, that's what you're describing because it, it never fails as human beings where anytime like this thing is good. Like, okay, let's go get as much as possible. Well, I won't say human beings, but a lot of people do that for sure. I feel Guilty, like our yeah. culture, society. Yeah, same here. And then it's it's the same thing with the other way. It's like, oh, carbon dioxide, That's that's bad. So let's get rid of it. And then you could take it obviously could take it way too far too. But really what the body needs is balance. And that's with everything. I mean, speaking of antioxidants, like those became very popular over 10, 20, 30 year period of like, oh, these fight cancer and free radicals and all that. And and there's truth to that. But you can have too much antioxidants as well. And uh, you know, I've had like a an expert on the on the show who's an expert in uh, mitochondria health and fatty acids. And so she'd point out that people actually tend to way overdo omega-3s, which are anti-inflammatory, but they actually shut down some of the inflammation that's needed. Like the body mm. needs inflammation. That's a repair mechanism. It's how it deals with injury and, and things that aren't supposed to be there. And so if you just hammer that with antioxidants, then that's actually not a good thing. And, and she sees it clinically. A lot of people come in with problems. So it's like, yeah, it's everything. The, the body's an amazing... And really with our whole environment and nature, like everything's an ecosystem and, and has these balancing equilibriums. And so if we just dump a lot of one thing, whether it's supplements, vitamins, you name it, it's going to throw other things out of balance. And we don't, for all that we do know in science, we don't understand everything. And, and I really think we overlook this, this teeter-totter scale that's going to move when you, when you hyper-focus on one thing. Yeah, beautifully said. And I mean, that's one thing with like the herb breathing is people think I'm going to super oxygenate. Like, because you think that, right? It's like, well, oxygen's good. Let's get more of it. Let's take a big breath. And and, and it's not, it's like the opposite because like the, the body's so smart, right? It says, well, I got to, he's, this person's getting too much oxygen. Like I need to, I need to make sure they don't get too much. So I'm going to hold on to it. I'm not going to let it get into the tissues and things. So yeah, it's definitely a balance. And uh, the middle path is like always usually the, the smartest. So let's so say someone starts to do this, starts to balance their carbon dioxide, their oxygen a little bit more. Then practically speaking, what does that translate into? What are some of the benefits people enjoy? What are reasons for someone to start to dip their toe in this in this pool? Sure. So the biggest benefit I think is is energy. Um, naturally, right? Oxygen's our number one energy source. You start to balance that, you feel better energy. Um, and, and as far as just that aspect of it, like the carbon dioxide stuff, like it can help with endurance because you're learning to utilize oxygen better. Um, and, and basically when you're out for a walk or a jog or whatever it might be out surfing, you might just notice that you don't tire quite as quickly or that you don't get fatigued as fast as you used to. So that can be another one. And then health wise, right? If you're getting more oxygen to the cells that, that can help everything. Um, and so it's kind of like one of these weird, you start to sound a little, you know, panacea ish because it's like, well, once you get more oxygen, it's going to selectively help whatever your ailment is in a lot of ways, because that's what your body needs for energy. So if you're not getting enough oxygen to a specific organ or something, it may help that a little bit. Um, and you might notice that. 
But what's interesting is a lot of the benefits come from slowing the breath. So in addition to the carbon dioxide and, and this stuff, when we actually start to slow down our breathing rate, that's when we can activate the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system, which then that's where a lot of the things that you'll feel in your daily life with like emotional regulation, with just feeling calmer, sleeping better, having more energy, those types of things can uh, can compound with that. But just, just the less breathing itself uh, can help with energy, endurance, blood flow, a lot of, uh, a lot of things that you'll feel as basically just, I feel better, right? I feel happier. I feel more energetic or whatever it might be. Yeah. Okay. So what does this look like if someone wants to get started? Because if, if there was a commercial, if there was some pill that was advertised, that's like, Hey, you can sleep better, have more energy, think more clearly, like have bet, you know, feel lighter emotions. It would immediately be a bestseller. But then when we talk about something like breath or anything else where it's already within our power, I find that people just overlook it. They're like, yeah, yeah, I would love more energy. I would love to sleep better. But, you know, breath, they can't really do it, can it? So what does it look like if someone were to to start? What are like a couple examples? Like you've mentioned slower breathing, but, you know, can, can someone do that in five minutes a day to start? Do they need to do an hour? Um, just practically speaking, what it, what is it like? And I'm just trying to connect for people, if someone's listening to this and likes the idea, but isn't fully sold that it can help because they won't know till they actually try it, right? We don't know any, till we feel it and experience it. There's, there's nothing more powerful than that. That, that can be the wake up call. But if someone's still, you know, deciding or, or isn't totally sold on the idea, what would it practically look like to get started? and and go from there. The simplest place would be first nasal breathing, just focusing on breathing through your nose more often. When you catch yourself mouth breathing during the day, switch to the nose until it becomes habitual. So that's kind of like the the lowest hanging fruit. And if you want to try the mouth tape, go for it or a different device if, if it's, you know, if it works for you. But for the actual breathing practice, I would recommend, you know, a slow breathing practice, which means breathing at a rate between, let's say, five and seven breaths per minute. And there's tons of apps out there. You can get your favorite breathing app. Uh, the one I like is called the breathing app. It's real simple to find on the app store. It's free, no email, no nothing, just the breathing app. Uh, and, and it has this really calming tone. And you would breathe in through your nose for the time for the inhale, and then either out through your nose or out through pursed lips for the exhale. Real simple, slow and steady. Breathe in through the nose, deep into your belly and then out through the mouth or through the nose, whatever is most comfortable for you. If you're brand new to it, I would say exhale through your mouth because that gives you a little bit more control and you'll learn how to extend your breath a little bit easier. Um, but always in through the nose, that's critical. And that would really be it. You would need about five minutes a day minimum. So there was a wonderful study from the Health and Human Performance Foundation, HHPF. They went through and basically looked at every breathing study ever done. And it was a, a meta-analysis or systematic review type thing. And so they, you know, they brought them all together and say, what, what can we do? What are some practical guidelines we can suggest? And it turned out that at least five minutes a day of some sort of slow breathing technique, uh, basically any of them that doesn't even have to be like a specific technique can significantly reduce our stress levels. Um, and so that's kind of like a catch all for everything, right? If you're, if you're less stressed, you, everything works better. So rather than trying to measure all the physiology, they just found a whole bunch of studies that looked at stress and, and looked at, so five minutes a day is, is the minimum. Now, from my experience, I need at least about 10 minutes to really feel that drop and like just complete relaxation and that kind of like relaxation response that Herbert Benson talks about a lot, uh, take over, but if, if that's too much for you, right, five minutes is all you need to, to, from a statistical standpoint, that seems to be what we need to, to experience benefits. So nasal, deep into your belly, out through your mouth, through pursed lips, like you're blowing on hot soup, five minutes a day. Uh, I would suggest first thing in the morning before you do anything to set the stage for a great day ahead. Um, and that would be it. Like that, that's all you really need uh, from, from everything we know from, from the science. I have different, you know, I'm huge into like longer and doing, you know, more, but uh, that's, that's is from a scientific perspective, that's the best they know right now. You know, five minutes, that's, that's a lot less than, uh, 
you know, probably what someone would need it for exercise or the gym. Um, so that's, you know, not asking, not asking too much. That's pretty accessible. Right. And, and then I would urge people to remember what we talked about earlier, right? Like that middle path, like if you love it and don't overdo it either, right? Like maybe max it at 20 minutes, you know, uh, if, if you're really into the slow breathing and you think, oh, I feel great. That seems to be a nice upper threshold for, I don't, there's no studies looking at like, is there too much? It doesn't seem like there could be because it's, it's really mostly relaxing, but I've found for personal experience about 20 minutes, you're not going to probably see too much more benefit after that. That slow breathing, is that the same thing as resonant breath rate? Yes, that's about the same. So I, I use the word slow breathing because it's more broad, like it can encompass anything that's about four, or let's say three to seven breaths per minute. Whereas resonance breathing has like a specific goal of like bringing resonance between your cardiovascular, autonomic and respiratory systems so that they're basically in this, it's a theoretical thing like that as you inhale, your heart rate will be increasing. As you exhale, your heart rate will be decreasing and will maximize your heart rate variability, which is a hot, hot topic, right? We all know the power of HRV. Um, and so in theory, resonance breathing is to do that, to get us, find that frequency of breath that is unique to your physiology. Josh's physiology will be completely different than mine. It will change day to day because you change as a human and find that breath rate to fall into resonance. Now, in practice, what you see in papers is they'll say, we did resonance breathing and they just made them breathe at six breaths a minute. That's what most people do is six breaths a minute. That's the most commonly thing uh, used resonance rate you'll see. Um, but the th So I just avoid the terminology because I don't want to be, I'm trying to, to yeah, be more broad about it. But if you hear slow breathing, resonance breathing, or uh, there's a lot of different names, coherent breathing. Most of them just mean breathing slowly at about five to six breaths a minute. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I learned about resonant breathing. It's just a fascinating idea. Like you hit this harmonizing cadence, like you said, for you as a, just the individual. And then suddenly all these systems in your body, nervous system, cardiovascular, respiratory, they're all harmonizing together and you're getting these, these outsized benefits and, and Yes, there's a lot of scientific benefits, but also just feeling, you know, incredibly better. Um, but yeah, I understand why they do the the six breaths a minute because that's easy, yeah, easy, easy math, yeah, right? And you know, like one thing, there's a book called Heart Breath Mind by Leah Lagos, and, and I, I think it's in that one where she discusses this. But if you try out, like maybe start at four breaths a minute or five, whatever, like feels like a decent lower limit for you for in my, oh, it feels too slow or whatever and kind of work your way up to six or, or down from six until it gets too challenging or down from seven. You just feel it. Like just feel your body, do it for two minutes each time, two minutes, take a break, two minutes, take a break it. And you will find your resonance frequency. You know, you'll find, oh, that one felt great. You know, like uh, you can use an equal inhale with an equal exhale, you know, like five seconds in, five seconds out or six seconds in, six seconds out. Or you can slightly extend the exhalation. So like four seconds in, six seconds out, five seconds in, seven seconds out. Uh, play with that too. You know, there's all sorts of different knobs you can turn, which is why it gets pretty complicated. But if you want to find your, you know, if you want to experience what Josh is just talking about, right? Like this harmonizing and you feel better, like you can kind of find what your body needs by, by doing about two minutes of each one. Uh, and then picking the one that feels best and doing that for an additional five minutes or whatever it might be. Can this be done in the breathing app or what's a place where people can be guided, kind of set the parameters? And then, like you said, where they can just change the dial and or, or do people just need to count um, or use a timer or something for the seconds? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, counting is an interesting one. Uh, some people do recommend counting. I don't. Uh, counting requires a lot of cognitive effort and, and that's good in some cases, but, uh, I use counting really like, I guess, targeted for sleep to turn off my brain a little bit, but I would recommend gra grabbing an app. There is, uh, the breathing app I mentioned, they allow you to do, let's see, five and six breaths a minute. So if, if you want simplicity, you don't really want to mess around too much. You could try five breaths a minute six breaths a minute, 
and they offer either equal or slightly longer exhale. So that's one way to do it. Just that would be four different breathing techniques you could try and find the one that's right for you. But there are tons of apps and uh, I should I should just pull out my phone so I don't say the wrong one. But um, there's one called Breathe. It's just Breathe and it has, well, I changed the logo on it. It lets you change the logo. <laughs> I'm trying to, trying to make it real practical for people here. But that one has a lot of flexibility. You can do down to like the 10th of a second. So you could do 4.3 seconds in and 6.7 seconds out. And a lot of people love that because uh, it gives you a lot of tweaking. Finally, if you have some sort of like polar strap or whatever, like a heart and HRV strap that you can wear, you can hook it up to the Elite HRV app and that will do this for you. Like they have a program to, to find your resonance frequency. Uh, and so you can do it that way if you, if you want to, you know, really nerd out on it and have fun and, and see the HRV changes. But I think you really need the strap. Uh, I, you know, I'm not sure about some of those other things that measure HRV. There's a lot of proprietary knowledge and things that haven't been tested. So I always recommend something with a strap if you're measuring HRV, just because that seems to be the most accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I did a, a dive into this because I had two different devices and the HRVs were so different right. for each each one. And, and I learned just what you said. The tech is different from each one. They're measuring it slightly differently. So yeah. I mean, I, but I think what you said at the beginning, like people just start what feels good yeah. and then experiment and try. And uh, I also like what you said earlier too, is we're, you're different every day. Yeah. And you're always changing. So um, I actually, I didn't know that the right, your resonant breath rate changed every day, but that makes, makes perfect sense. Uh, it's probably not a huge change, but you know, slight, I could see. And I should probably iterate on that. Like there's a lot, there has been plenty of studies looking at resonance frequency breathing. Uh, and they, basically what they do is, is like they bring someone in, they do like, let's say six or seven different breath rates. They find the one that maximizes their low frequency heart rate variability, looking at it spectrally or whatever in the frequency domain. And they say, okay, that's your resonance frequency. And that has a lot of merit to it. Like the low frequency, when you're breathing slowly, the low frequency HRV matters. Um, that, as far as we know today, of course, things always change, but today that's what, that's what we know. And so they say, okay, this is your resonance frequency break. Go breathe at it for 10 minutes a day or 20 minutes a day for four weeks. And then we'll look at your changes. And then they find, oh yeah, they improved. But then it turns out if you just tell people to breathe the six breaths a minute, it's the same thing. Like they get the same benefits. They can't find a distinguishing that I've never seen. There's one study that shows that the resonance frequency improved one thing slightly more, but then it actually wasn't as good as in another thing. So it was a little mixed. Um, so there's never, as far as I know, there's never been a study to show that the resonance frequency is supreme over just five or six breaths a minute. Um, and then there was a study that I haven't gone through in depth, so I should, I, sh I can't speak to it. Like I just read the abstract and kind of glanced at it and I was like, oh, that's interesting. But it was that, yeah, if you bring someone back in two days in a row, their, fre their resonance frequency changes because you change as a human. Like the whole point of it is to harmonize your systems and as you change, you know, those things might, might alter. Now there's probably some, some, you know, HRV people out there that would tell me I'm wrong. So I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I know personally that the, br the breath rate I, I enjoy most changes every single day. Like, you know, it's, it, if, if I'm that specific, I usually just pick one and go with it. But if, uh, if you want to be like, you know, testing on changing it is, is really useful to see how you feel that day based on how well you slept, what have you eaten recently or not? Because all these things change how how easy or difficult slow breathing is. Well, I like that overall. It's a lot more accessible. It's like, hey, f five to six breaths a minute, that gets comparable benefits. So forget about all the thinking and analyzing, forget about all the high-tech equipment to make super minor changes, just go for five or six. And then the benefit of doing that too is you start to learn how it feels for you. Which, which I think we need more of and a little bit less of an authority figure told me or this tech told me I need to do this. You know, there's, there's a time and place for all that, but we're a little bit heavy on that side. So I think people, they can have that tool and say, I know what I need to do to feel great and have a good day or even better, like I feel confident to, you know, adjust, do a slightly, slightly slower breathing, slightly faster and find the right level for me, whether it's, you know, to start the day or, or 
then taking it into their day and being able to use it at different times. Like that's very empowering. And then they got a tool that's always with them. Beautifully said. I mean, that's in, I mean, I, I'm years into it now, so I probably sound crazier, but like, that's, that's what the breath is, right? It's like learning about yourself. Like you're discovering who you are. You're learning about interoception and all these things, like you're learning to read your body. And so to, to rely on a device to tell you what to breathe to me is counterproductive at that level. Like you're trying to become more of who you want to be and learn how, how you feel and all these different things. And if you're like, well, I feel great, but my HRV told me I didn't sleep well. I guess I don't feel great. You know, it just that defeats the purpose in my opinion. Now, I understand there's lots of science out there, so I shouldn't overstep my reach here. But I just feel like a lot of it is, you know, the, that's what pranayama and yoga and all these practices were built for. It's like before we had all this technology as a way to learn about our bodies, to actually take control of how we feel and things like that. And this gives us the tool rather than letting a device tell you, you shouldn't be happy right now because you didn't sleep as good as I, you know, as science tells you you should. So anyways, I'll stop. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, t- it's totally true. I mean, I literally did that for, for six months that I had my aura ring. Like I let it, you know, I'm like, oh, this is, this means something about me. And that data is super useful, but I think it's better. Either you need to look at it long enough to get, get over that. Like now I look at it and I don't, I almost don't care. Like it's definitely not going to affect my day. It's just going to give me data points that I'm going to use over the long run. Is there anything I want right. to tweak or do differently? I think it's useful in, in that sense, but definitely not about your mindset, how you feel and and making a bunch of snap judgments about your health every morning when you you know see the numbers. Right. Yeah, that's great. So if someone's starting, like I, when I started playing with slow breathing, it was actually uncomfortable. Even six breaths a minute. It was too slow. Felt like exertion. I got all stirred up. So I had to go a little bit more higher, higher frequency breathing than that. Where on, is there an average place that people start is six uh, work for most people or as you, as you work with people and see how they interact, how, how, where's a good place to start? And then earlier you said they could work their way down, which makes sense. But what do people you know, do, do, is that reaction common when people start slowing down the breath? Yes, of course. Right. And, uh, p- paradoxically, what a lot of people do is they over breathe. So even though they slow down their breath rate, they make up for it because they feel that air hunger they, and they take these big breaths. And then that counter is counterproductive with the CO2, uh, tolerance we were talking about earlier. And so what you normally find is that with a few practice sessions that dissolves, that over breathing tends to dissolve, but finding the right rate up front is really important. So it's really like anything below 10 breaths a minute will be helpful. So if you, if you go to sit and you say, Oh, I heard Nick on a podcast, I'm going to try six breaths a minute. And you feel like, wow, that was stressful. That is not the point, right? We're here to like relax our bodies and improve our physiology, improve our recovering things and, and being stressed won't help with that. So you would take it up a notch, maybe seven breaths, maybe eight breaths until you find what's right for you. Realizing that with time, you probably will bring it down to six breaths per minute as you learn, as your body changes, right? As your physiology gets used to those higher levels of CO2 and, and breathing at those lower frequencies. So the most common starting point is six, six breaths a minute, five seconds in, five seconds out, or four seconds in and six seconds out. Uh, but play with it and see see where you go. Um, two things I'll suggest. One is lying down. Like it gets so overlooked because people think I want to sit and meditate and cross, you know, and full lotus and stuff. But you can just lay there and do this. And it's really relaxing. In fact, a lot of the studies when you look into them, they're all supine. They're all lying down on their back. And so, you know, that's super relaxing. And it takes some of the, uh, you know, it, it just seems to take some away from the breathing muscle. It makes it way easier to slow down your breath. Um, and so I, I highly recommend if, if it feels challenging, try it lying down. If you won't fall asleep, right? You don't want to fall asleep, but try it lying down and that will help you get down to that six breaths a minute or, or whatever's right for you. And then the second one is that exhale through pursed lips because the exhale, when you, when you feel out of breath, a lot of times on the exhale through the nose, you initially dump a lot of air. Like it's like, you like, you can't wait to, to start the exhale. So you, you get rid of it. And then that makes it really challenging to finish the exhale. And so when you use pursed lips, 
it helps you control that initial part of the exhale and that lets you extend it a lot longer in, in more comfortably. So those would be the two tips I have there. But yeah, I mean, it's a really common for, for people to feel stressed even at six breaths a minute. It's, there's no judgment here. It's not like, oh, I, I suck at this too, right? Like that's exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do. So, um, so just move up until you find what works for you. And as long as it's below 10, it's usually pretty helpful. Although even above that, if you're controlled and you feel good, I'm not sure it would matter. Yeah, I like the, the, the pursed lips tip is a good one just to control the exhale because that, that's always what I've had to struggle with. Like I could always inhale much more easily than exhale and trying to make the exhale as long as the inhale was all, it felt like, you know, kind of like a push and kind of just kind of tight. Um, is that common? That's very common. Um, the inhale is more sympathetic, right? It's more, for the most part, it's more activating. You're activating muscles, you're pulling. And that's what a lot of us are in, right? That kind of like, let's go. <laughs> We're always in this fight or flight mode. And so the exhale is a little bit more relaxed. You're letting go. You're letting the exhale occur. Your diaphragm, you know, pops back into place, so to speak, and pushes the air out without much effort. You don't really have to do much on the exhale. And so for a lot of people, that's challenging. Uh, to, to just let the body breathe and breathe out. So there's uh, Andrew Weil, in, you know, very popular integrative medicine doctor. He has a, a breathing technique where you basically, that's the first step he says, like you got to learn to exhale before you do anything because a good exhale will allow a good inhale. So it all starts with the exhale. And so you, you basically go <sighs> till you can't breathe out anymore. Then you try to squeeze a little bit more out. Then you squeeze a little more. Then you teach your body to squeeze that air out. Uh, and that will help you. And then the next inhale will come very naturally. Uh, it might feel a little odd, right? But you just keep doing that for maybe a few minutes to train your body to exhale. Um, and yeah, of course, the exhale is so critical. That's uh, arguably, you could say it's, you know, a breathing cycle is an exhale, then an inhale. We always think like inhale and exhale, but uh, I've been told ancient traditions, you know, viewed it the opposite, that the breath cycle started on an exhale. Um, and I, I love that. I think, I think about that a lot. Like if I, if I start with an exhale, it just, yeah, there's so many ways you can frame that that are really powerful. So that's, that goes on a tangent, but yeah, try the exhale practice and see how it goes. It does go on a tangent, but I, I like it. You know, <laughs> I gotta, get a little gotta, too gotta, excited. Sorry. <laughs> got to make room for something else new to come in. Right. You know, there's yeah. got to be space for it. Yeah. And that's definitely can be a metaphor for, for different parts of life. Okay. So you can actually just re sort of retrain the body through training these lo longer exhales that over time it'll get the idea and, um, I guess get, get more comfortable with it because that was what always stuck out to me. It's like, I'm doing everything I can to exhale, and my, but my body doesn't want to. But that makes more sense when I, we think about it in terms of sympathetic and parasympathetic. This nervous system, this is the autonomic nervous, nervous system, right? So the part you, you don't really control, you don't control with your mind. It's, it's, it's the unconscious part. And the cool thing about breath that I've always found fascinating is that is the one bridge between in, into the autonomic nervous system, which is running on its own. And then, you know, you, you look at if the body gets in, you know, a programmed state of the nervous system or locked in a trauma response, then that can just keep running. Like you said, a lot of, a lot of us are in sympathetic, sympathetic dominant, just more fight or flight, more of a stress state. And so it's like, okay, well, when you realize that, you're like, all right, so how do we, how do I get out of that? How do I lower the baseline? And the breath is a, is a one way that's, a way in. Um, so mm -hmm. when say I'm, I'm doing that Dr. Wheels method or, or any method, just practicing longer as exhales, it's physiologically teaching the body to do it. Is it also engaging the nervous system? And I don't know if it's retraining the nervous system or allowing it to work flow more smoothly between sympathetic par parasympathetic, but is there something going on there as well? Sure. Yeah. So, um, most of the research is on kind of just slow breathing in general. Uh, so th there's a lot of, uh, whether or not 
each cycle of the breath in versus out is exactly correlated with one side of the nervous system or another is is challenging for me to find. Um, most people, it's under the assumption that the inhale is sympathetic and the exhale is parasympathetic. And so by, yeah, by learning to exhale, you're training your nervous system and you're balancing your nervous system. You're learning to basically bring these two into alignment rather than overly sympathetic because of the things you mentioned earlier. And, and this, by that same logic, a lot of people really enjoy longer exhalation. So they'll do like, let's say four seconds in and eight seconds out. And they'll find that deeply relaxing because it's engaging more of that parasympathetic nervous system for a longer time. This is the theory. Uh, now, there's some research that doesn't agree with this. So I, I'm not sure which one is right to be 100% honest. But I do know that if most people, if they extend their exhale a little bit longer, like four seconds in and six seconds out, it does seem to be more relaxing. And so, yeah, you're training your nervous system to, to chill out um, and it can be really beneficial. But in general, just the breathing, uh, bringing the breath rate down to, let's say, six breaths a minute is going to activate the, the more, it's going to make it more parasympathetic dominant. So you're going to be more relaxed when you finish. So it's going to basically exactly what you said, like it's giving you this gateway to the autonomic nervous system. And by slowing down the breath rate, it tells the body, hey, we're relaxed. That's what our body should do when we're relaxed. So if, if I'm getting these messages that the diaphragm's only moving this much, this slowly, and we're like, you know, we're breathing at this nice slow rate, we must be chill. So we're going to relay that signal back down to the rest of the body. And so it gives us this unbelievably designed mechanism that we're always doing that we completely forgot about, right? It was almost like whoever created us or whatever created, whatever it is, was like, oh, this is obvious. We'll just let them change their breath so they can get whatever they want out of it. And we just ignore it. Right. But yeah, we can just breathe real slowly. This will send signals through the vagus nerve to the brain and say, Hey, you're calm. And this will then chill out the rest of the body. So it is definitely nervous system training. Um, but whether or not just doing the exhales is enough is unclear. It seems like you got to do the slower breathing rate to, to basically tell the body you're calm. Things are good. Does it also impact the, our immune system? Sure. So um, this is becomes a little bit more indirect, right? But if you're lowering stress hormones, you're lowering cortisol, you're lowering adrenaline, you're helping to reduce inflammation, it's going to help with immune function. I don't know with just slow breathing, I'm trying to go through some of the things I've read and see if I can... I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the the science is on that, but like from a more indirect route, yeah, like by lowering stress, we're going to improve everything, right? And so one of those will be immune function. Now, interestingly, some of like the the Wim Hof style breathing, like the hyperventilation, the deliberate stressor where you over breathe and then you hold your breath for a long time and it puts your body in this crazy sympathetic uh, stress response has been shown to improve immune function. Like it's been measured directly. So the breath gives us that gateway, but whether or not slow breathing can do it is unclear to me. I can say from my experience, yes, it helps just because I sleep better. If you sleep better, your immune system functions better. If you are a little bit more relaxed and not stressed throughout the day, your immune system seems to be better. So indirectly, definitely. But um, the only studies I know of that have shown it directly are using more fast breathing Wim Hof style stuff. And, and we can go into that if you want to go down that warm hole. It's a pretty deep one, but it's it's pretty interesting. <laughs> well, let's go down it a little because so many people come across Wim Hof. That's, that's become quite popular. Um, but I myself have been more more drawn to the slow breathing too. And just in terms of benefits, and this also has to do with health status and stage of life. So I think there's a time and place for everything. Same thing with cold plunging like that. Well, I guess Wim Hof does some of that too, but I never, I never got into that. And my understanding of it now is going back to the, the nervous system, sympathetic dominance. Like that was my overriding state in, in the nervous system. And there comes a point in time when you, you kind of push into that far enough. And like my, my health had, I hadn't had a health crash, but it was on edge basically enough where doing something to really pump a lot of adrenaline, like a, a cold plunge or cold showers, 
Like that was my body just couldn't handle that at the time. So it wasn't good, but it's, it's kind of broadly touted as, you know, I'm, I'm talking cold plunges right now, uh, ice baths, like super beneficial. Everyone should do it. And I really don't know. There's hardly anything that everyone should do. I mean, breathing is one, but there's, it's like one, you know, one person's food is another person's poison. That's totally true. So I think there's nuance to everything. So yeah, it would be great to cover a little bit like what um, the Wim Hof, the more intense approach uh, and contrasting that with the slow breathing, just 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 to give people a background so they can, you know, investigate and have these things in, in mind the next time someone tells them you got to do this one or got to do that one. Yeah, no, that's a, yeah, I love that perspective you just shared too, because that's, yeah, resonates deeply with me. So I would say, Wim Hof is a, a fascinating one that I mentioned at the very beginning, like that's what got me into it. So as much as I don't do it anymore, I still respect anyone who wants to go do it. I would never deter someone because it got me where I am today with it. So it opened my eyes to the power of the breath. But essentially what Wim, Wim's method is, is that you, you breathe deeply and, you know, big breaths, uh, nose or mouth. Uh, he doesn't care. He's, he says the hole doesn't matter. It's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> just get it in there. It's pretty, yeah, he's, he's great. Um, and you, you take these big breaths, you know, you do about 30 or 40 of them and then you exhale, you, one more big one, you exhale and then you hold your breath for as long as you possibly can. And then when it gets intense, you take this huge breath in, you hold for like 10 seconds and then you repeat. And so, that is his method. And what it does is it it's a, it's a major sympathetic breath. I mean, it just activates every single side of it. So you're breathing faster and bigger, and that tells your body stress mode. Like, you know, when we're stressed, what do we do? We over breathe. When we're exercising, what do we do? We breathe faster and harder. So when you just do it laying there, just like when you do it laying there and it tells your body you're calm, when you do a slow breathing, the exact opposite. When you breathe fast, it tells your body, I'm running or I'm doing something stressful or your brain that at least. And this will activate the sympathetic branch of the nervous system. So just that alone, sympathetic. And then you do this super long breath hold where you go for maybe one, two, three, four minutes holding your breath. And this will drop your blood oxygen saturation significantly down into 50%. And I mentioned earlier, like we're normally at like 96, 99%. Uh, and this can get you down to near 50% or, or even lower. And that tells your body I'm dying, right? <laughs> like, well, this is crazy. Why am I, what is going on? And so all of this floods your body with adrenaline, like just, and that's why people who are type A, myself included, get drawn to it because you feel invincible when you finish it. And it floods your body with adrenaline and the best analogy I've heard, and there, there's no direct research for this, but the best like correlation I found is there's like a field of like psycho neuroimmunology. And when you get into like a, a stress state like this, your body's expecting either a wound or an infection of some kind. And so it's, it floods the body with um, immune response, like, an, you know, or anti-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory things and immune, uh, things like different uh, hormones and things to basically counteract this. And so what Wim has done is kind of hack that. He's found a way to both hyperventilate and then hold your breath so long that it tricks your body into like this massive flood of adrenaline, which then is going to allow the body to like throw out all this healing agents, assuming that you're either, you just got bit by or you're running from a tiger or whatever the analogy might be or you uh just got infected with something and so it ends up being like a positive on your immune system and your inflammation and which is fascinating because you would think well that's the exact opposite like he's you're stressing your body and it's good somehow so he's found a way to do it in a controlled manner and so when they measure like levels of inflammation in people with like spondyloarthritis um they find that, oh, their inflammation went down after doing WIMS program. Um, and when they, you know, his famous study where himself and then he taught untrained people to do his breathing technique, they were able to withstand the E. coli bacteria or endotoxin injection that everyone gets a fever, everyone gets sick. There's no way around it. And he found a way around it because he 
you know, flooded his body with adrenaline. Um, and so that's how it works. Um, but like you mentioned earlier, like, oh, I got into the slower breathings, the stuff because of my health condition or like where I was at in my life. Right. Um, that you got to keep that in mind. Like if you have any type of like heart issue, cardiovascular problems, you're pregnant or some sort of like mental disorder where, you know, be safe. Like you would not want to do this and flood your body with stress and adrenaline if you already have hypertension, you know, that could be really dangerous. So just keep that in mind. I think people should be very cautious. Go see a trained Wim Hof instructor who knows all the stuff. I'm just an enthusiast, you know, go find someone who can, who can teach you safely. How long a time period do these studies follow people? Are these benefits uh, short term or has there been any extended uh, look at, at the health effects? So for the endotoxin studies where they're injecting people with like some strand of E. coli and they fight it off, it's short term. So they, they train them for a period um, and then they go in and do the injection and the effects that like anti-inflammatory effect and that immune response, that enhanced immune response is more, I think it's more short lived. It's like because of the breathing itself, that's what's causing it. But the study I mentioned on the spondyloarthritis, I think that's like, in, in, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to mess that up, but it, uh, that was over, it was like four to eight weeks they did that. And they measured uh, a few different inflammatory markers and found that it went like the baseline went down. So like their measurement before and then their measurement after when they were not doing the Wim Hof technique, you know, they were just resting when they got their measurements taken, their blood drawn, um, the inflam inflammation went down. So it does seem to have lasting benefits. There's a little uncertainty because there's three components to his method. He, he has the, um, the breath, cold and then he uses a, a meditation technique like a third eye meditation um it's unclear how much contribute how much each of those components are contributing to that to that endpoint but it seems like the breath is mostly responsible for like the anti-inflammatory stuff um so which is kind of cool if you hate the cold and you still think his methods neat and all that you know it gives you a, a an avenue but um yeah i mean I think four to eight weeks was the one study. Nick, if if people want to keep learning more from you, follow more of your work, what's the best way for them to do that? Sure. So I'm on Instagram at the breathing diabetic. Um, and I got a couple websites at the breathing diabetic.com uh, and a newsletter there. And then I also have a, a program called breath learning, uh, breath learning center with at breath And that's more of like, yeah, that's more me being me. Uh, Breathing diabetic is more about diabetes, but uh, the breathlearning.com is just more about, you know, using the breath in all the ways we've talked about today to be better people, essentially to try to be healthier, have better mental health and spiritual health, but just really just live a better life through the breath as like a metaphor for understanding life and things like that. So yeah, that's, that's where you can find me. All right, great. We'll link to all those in the show notes. So if you're listening, you can just scroll down and click on whichever one you like. Nick. Thanks so much for being here. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Josh.